Die Gewerkschaftsführer Lech Wałęsa auf einem Treffen von Solidarität. Night by night, nation by nation, the news headlines have told their story of the year. Tonight, we tell a different story. For the next two hours, we invite you to look back at the past year from the point of view of the human family as a whole. That family now numbers four and a half thousand million people. It's an unimaginable number. Easier, perhaps, to see the human family as just 100 people gathering for a family photograph. To show the makeup of the world's population using 100 people, you need to start with just one Briton. He would be joined by 10 other Europeans from both Eastern and Western Europe. Six would come from the Soviet Union. And another six from the United States and Canada. This is the first quarter of the family, the citizens of the industrialized North. Roughly another quarter come from just one nation, the People's Republic of China. and more than another quarter from the rest of Asia. India alone sends 16. Then come nations like Indonesia, Japan, Vietnam and the Philippines. and four from the Middle East. So Asia is home to well over half the family. Then come eight from Latin America, from the Andes and the Amazon, from Central America and the Caribbean. And to complete this portrait of the human family, 10 from the continent of Africa, representing its 800 ethnic groups and 1,000 languages and just one from Australasia and the Pacific. What immediately strikes you is what a young family it is. 36 of our 100 are children under the age of 15. Only six are older than 65. Twenty of us have a radio, seven have a TV set, five of us have a car. <laughs> and in the past 12 months, there has been one death in the family, but there has also been one wedding and three babies born. This then is the family portrait. Multiply the image by 45 million and you have the actual population of the Earth. What happened to this human family in 1981? Health was its first concern. But what really happened to human health wasn't easy to assess from the images of health that crossed our screens during the year. You're a solution. In San Francisco, doctors are developing a mechanical heart called the Mark I Bionic Heart. The mechanical heart can perform most of the functions of a living one. Someday, diseased human hearts may be replaced. Einfach leben kann zu Kopfschmerzen in nervösen Spannungen führen. Aspirin Super hat das neue Wirkprinzip, das schnell Schmerzen beseitigt. Nur zwei Aspirin Super in einem Glas Wasser und sie merken. The 100 bed hospitals in Saudi Arabia has gone to a British based firm. Worth 50 million pounds, it includes the most modern medical technology. Already, the new Riyadh hospital has an advanced linear electron accelerator for cancer treatment. 
and along with a sophisticated computer system for monitoring patients, it's part of a massive expansion of medical facilities in Saudi Arabia, rivaling the best equipped hospitals elsewhere in the world. Offrez-vous le luxe de fleurs de montagne, la beauté de votre corps et sa santé. Fleurs de montagne, le gel moussant pour la douche qui vous promet une peau en bonne santé dans un corps sain. Une formule scientifique. But from the point of view of the majority of the human family, the health headline of the year was something quite different. For one little known breakthrough is now making more difference to the health of more people than any other. Salah Hamshali is part of that breakthrough. He's a farmer in the Democratic Republic of the Yemen, about the poorest Arab country in the world. He's married with two children. Three years ago, his third child, a baby daughter, died at the age of nine months. Five million children died this year of the same cause, simple diarrhea. In the narrow fields along the wadi, Salah earns his family's living, growing crops like maize and tomatoes. Not easy in a country where 99% of the land is barren. And most days he has to break off from his work. One of the women in the village is worried about her 18-month-old daughter. And for the next half hour, Sala stops being a farmer and becomes a health guide. He is one of 50 primary health care workers in the South Yemen and one of over 2 million now working in the developing world. His home is on the way and he needs to pick up his satchel full of basic medical equipment. These few items can cope with the common local illnesses and save lives. His practice is the village of Marib, where he has lived all his life. Until 1981, the 40 families on this hillside had no local medical help at all. Doctors and hospitals were available at Lachej or in the capital, Aden, 60 miles away. But they were beyond the physical and financial reach of village people. The result was that in these houses, one baby in every six died in childhood. Sala knows at once what is wrong and explains to the child's mother that diarrhea is draining essential fluids and salts out of her daughter's body. Without treatment, she is likely to die within a few days. Now there is a treatment, a breakthrough which can be used at home. Four Coke bottles measure one litre of boiled water. Sala adds the contents of a sachet supplied by UNICEF. It's mainly salts and sugar to counter dehydration. He explains to the parents about using boiled water and arranges to leave enough packets of salts to last until the child is better. In 1981, 14,000 children died every day from diarrhea. 90% of them could have been saved by this treatment. It costs 10 cents. It took uh, 15 minutes to give her the right remedy. 
and we probably saved their life. If it had been a few years ago, there would be nothing to do. We would have had to watch her die. That's what happened to my daughter. I wish we'd had the idea sooner. But now we are changing things. Um, Ma'rib was the, one of the first villages to try this idea of primary health care. Uh, I'd heard that the government was trying to set up something around here, but I had no idea what it was. Then I went to a village meeting called by the deputy mayor. Well, he was really enthusiastic about uh, primary health care. He said if we waited till we could afford uh, doctors and hospitals, we could wait forever. But we could uh, save lives and prevent disease ourselves. The first thing was to elect one person to be trained as the health guide for the village. Uh, people were suspicious at first, uh, but uh, we agreed to try it and I was elected. I was very pleased, also a bit nervous. Well, I had to go for a training, a three weeks training at the nearest health center. There were uh, 50 others on the course, ordinary people, farmers mostly, and some teachers. Um, what was needed was to be able to read and write. They taught us straight away that the health guide must not only cure disease, but uh, even more important, must learn to fight the causes of ill health. After the training, I, I went back to work. But now I had uh, two jobs. You're not paid for being a health guide, so now I fit the work in with farming. <laughs> In my father's time, people didn't really understand uh, what was making so many of them ill. We used to think that uh, water was water, and we used to drink it straight from the wadi. But uh, people were washing, and animals were drinking in the same water. So every village lower down the wadi used to drink all the diseases of the villages higher up. So now we're uh, digging into the hillside for drinking water, and uh, building a small reservoir. But there is a problem. In order to finish it, we need more cement. All the villages that have health guides are asking for cement, and there isn't enough to go around. It's the same with uh, malaria. We know now that uh, mosquitoes breed in stagnant water. But uh, we had to wait months for uh, sprays and insecticides uh, to deal with them. And the uh, hardest of all is to change the way people do things. Uh, when we wanted to burn all the rubbish to prevent flies, people said, oh, Saleh's making more work for us. Uh, we've never done this before. So I said, uh, but you're getting ill, aren't you? Why don't you try this for one month? And if it, you don't see any difference, uh, then stop. <laughs> Yes, uh, I'm always very busy. The villagers used to laugh at me. When I first went around with, with my bag, they'd say, Ah, oh, he's mad. <laughs> uh, does he think he's a doctor after three weeks training? Actually, I never say I'm a doctor. I say, I'm just a health guide, but I can be useful to you. The number of cases needing treatment has gone down from 100 a month to less than 20. It's been a very eventful year. When there is an emergency, you have to go at once to see what's wrong. My friend, Mohammed Saif, has a high fever and his mother is very worried. She was right. It seemed an unusually bad case of malaria. Usually, pills are enough, but uh, I thought that it was already too late. He needed an injection, so I decided to refer him to the um, health center at Musamir. 
um, that meant an hour's wait while the brother went on to the health center to try and get them to send an ambulance. Well, the mother was very worried about uh, the child that he might die because uh, there was only a certain thing I could do as health guide. Uh, what Mohammed needed was medical attention and it was most important to get Mohammed to the health center as soon as possible. Well, now, now we have a Land Rover at the new health center. But there are no roads that way. And it's not an easy journey along the riverbed, especially for someone as ill as Muhammad. The health center is one hour away in the old Sultan's palace. He left Aden uh, with the British after independence in 1967. We used to believe that if a child under one became ill, there was just no remedy. So people didn't try to treat babies when they were ill. The child was left to the mercy of God. Hi. Everyone knows now that as health guides, we can refer patients to doctors when we are not sure what to do. The medical assistant on duty agreed with my diagnosis of malaria, but then found that Mohammed had a lung infection as well. If Mohammed doesn't improve, he can be referred on again to the general hospital in Aden for whatever treatment he needs. The big hospitals are all part of the primary healthcare system. They're there for everyone. You know, before independence, um, you could probably say that uh, it was health services for the minority, mainly those in towns. Uh, whereas now, we are looking at it as health for all throughout the country with a particular emphasis on those in rural areas who had nothing before independence or very, very uh, scarce health services. Dr. Amin Nasha, Deputy Minister of Health. Uh, people who needed to be uh, saved didn't either have the means of transport to get to the health center or health unit, or even if they have the means, that center was not there and they couldn't get in time. And most of the cases, even those who had the means to come to the main hospitals in town, usually arrived too late. And one of the uh, objectives of primary health care is to save people on the spot and then refer them when they're in a better position to move, if they could not, of course, be treated uh, on the spot. The same thing with malaria. Malaria kills many, many children and adults, and young and adults in particular simply because malaria is, in, uh, is not stable in the country. Uh, it exists with uh, higher prevalence in some areas and with low prevalence in others. And we have been getting a lot of people dying of cerebral malaria. The same thing uh, with the other infections, pneumonia, tuberculosis, uh, and so on and so forth. Simple diseases which could be treated on the spot without necessarily even having a doctor. I mean, you could train anybody who could read and write and who could handle a few items of medicine, uh, how to diagnose early and how to treat also early. Our priority is to save probably the 80, 90, 95% of the population and not the one to 2%. Now that will become a priority in a developed society where they have been able to overcome all the communicable diseases, all the diseases of malnutrition, all the uh, infectious diseases. But these are still killing thousands of lives every year. 
and we can treat them without necessarily having sophisticated medical equipment or even the ivory towers of the teaching hospitals. We can still treat them in tents in very, very simple health units. And that is primary health care again. On May the 19th, 1981, the news in the village of Marib was that Mohammed Saif was home, still weak, but out of danger. Without primary health care, Mohammed would probably have been one of this year's child mortality statistics. Salah Hamshali is one health guide in one village, in one country. Yet the day when every community in South Yemen has at least basic health care is still a long way in the future. Many countries now have pilot projects, but few have succeeded in building a nationwide health service around primary health care. The problem is not in the theory, but in the practice. It only works when it makes doctors and hospitals available to the majority through a local referral system. Otherwise, it can just be a way of fobbing off the poor with second-class medicine. But if primary health care doesn't work without the full backing of hospitals and doctors, neither will it work without clean water. That's why the UN this year launched the International Water Decade. More than three quarters of human illness in 1981 was related to the lack of safe water and sanitation. As in the industrialized countries in the last century, so in the developing world today, epidemic diseases like typhoid and cholera, when attacked by health education and piped water, rapidly recede. The cost of supplying clean water to every community in the world would be about $27 billion a year, one quarter what the world spent this year on alcohol. Overall, the human family did not become measurably healthier in 1981. Malaria, once targeted for eradication, killed more than a million people in Africa alone. It's making a comeback as less money is being spent on fighting it and more species become resistant to DDT and Dieldrin. We also lost ground to another waterborne disease, schistosomiasis, or snail fever, which now infects one person in every 20. 1981, the year of the disabled, was a year of vitamin A deficiency. The lack of a daily handful of green vegetables caused one quarter of a million children to go blind. If simple things like primary health care and clean water could be the real breakthroughs for human health, why haven't they happened? What the urban rich expect when they are ill are doctors and sophisticated hospitals, and they are the ones who take the decisions over health budgets. So reorienting health towards primary health care and rural health centres is politically difficult. The World Health Organization has set up a global target of health for all by the year 2000. By backing primary health care, WHO believes the target can be achieved. So what happened to human health in 1981? If there is a single indicator of the health of the family, it must be the well-being of its children. In 1981, 17 million of those children have died. Most died of measles, diarrhoea, whooping cough, TB, diphtheria, of the daily malnutrition and poverty which continues unabated as this year comes to an end. So if we could see what was happening to the health of the family in 1981, we would see one of its children die every two seconds. But if all these children were to survive and grow up to have children of their own, wouldn't that mean even faster population growth? What actually happened to the world's population is the next chapter of the human story this year.
83 nations have held a national census in the past 12 months, and the result confirms some of the best world news of 1981. After hundreds of years of steady acceleration, the rate of climb in world population has at last slowed down. Six billion by the end of the century is the current prediction, instead of the eight billion once thought to be inevitable. Why are so many deciding to have less children? One of the countries leading the way to slower population growth is the island of Sri Lanka in the Indian Ocean. In the last 15 years, its birth rate has fallen by over a third. In the front line of that achievement are the country's 4,000 public health midwives. Kanta de Silva works in the villages around Anuradhapura in the north of the island. As well as delivering babies, Sri Lanka's midwives also advise on family planning. So it is the midwives who are at the point of population change, where parents are deciding to have fewer children. <laughs> The main reason is they know the children they do have will survive. In the olden days, many children died in infancy. So it made sense for these people to have large families. That doesn't happen now, so they have smaller families. I have about 18 villages to cover. I do the mother and baby work and the family planning at the same time. That was unthinkable a generation ago because the women had less education and very often it was the mother-in-law who decided how many children a woman should have. Most parents today, they make their own decisions. What I find is they can't be persuaded to start contraception until it makes sense in their own family circumstances to have less children. It is difficult to pin down what this change is when the family begins to see the future in a different way. Ranjini is an educated woman. She has three children. Kushmini is the eldest and she's ten. And Chandra, her husband, works for the Ceylon Transport Board. Now, this gives the family the security of a pension. So they won't need any children to look after them in their old age. So they've decided not to have any more children. I didn't understand the other reasons for not having any more children until I got to know the family better and saw what mattered to them in their life. Ranjini is up by 4.30 to get the children ready for school. She herself completed her education and didn't marry until she was into her 20s. That reduces the number of children a woman has. Now her children are growing up. She would like to go back to work and Chandra doesn't object. These days, more and more couples are deciding together what they want for the future of the family. It's when the children leave for school that you can see what education means to the family. The children, they make this formal gesture of leave-taking. It shows respect for the parents who have to struggle and make many sacrifices. Books, clothes and the bus fare to school are a big drain on the family income. Education itself has been free in Sri Lanka for 70 years. That's one of the main reasons the birth rate is falling. Because everywhere you look, you can see that it's the more educated families that have fewer children. But a lot of people are worried about unemployment now. So Chandra and Ranjini are anxious the children get some extra qualifications behind them. So they've been trying to do a bit more for their children.
After school, Kushmini and her brother and sister go to another teacher for private lessons in English. That, that is, is the school. The school. Gopal. Gopal is going from the school. This, this is house. They are not a very wealthy family. So if Chandra and Ranjini had even one more child, all these plans could just collapse. He has to keep a careful account of where every rupee goes if the children are to complete their education. Mama Mante Kata Samanin a private classes at 35 rupees given donor, Tundinata. Bus fees given donor, uh, 35 given donor. 70 rupees given donor, bus fees and. Um, it's because we want to plan for the children's future that we don't want any more, he says. To me, it's worth a million to have three well brought up children rather than to have an unwieldy number we couldn't look after properly. But I've got my problem families too. This is a household that hasn't yet got to that point of transition when it makes sense to have fewer children. Basun Nahe is a carpenter. And he has to struggle to keep his family because he hasn't got a regular income. His wife left school early and had four children by the time she was 20. Now she has eight. I've talked to her many times about family planning for her own sake apart from anything else. I think she would like to stop actually but she says she can't. That's because of her husband. He makes all the decisions even how she should vote and he wants a lot of children. He has no security and the only way he can afford to get help with the business is to have some sons. The other way would be getting a loan for machinery. He knows he could repay it, but going into debt is a great act of confidence in the future, which he is not ready for. The change will come with their children. Their eldest daughter, Kanti, has stayed on at school, and I know she's determined not to accept the kind of life her parents have had. There's been a very important thing. This year, there's been a new government scheme to promote family planning. It is a vasectomy scheme. Mobile teams are touring the villages, offering 500 rupees, that's a month's wages, to married men who will agree to a vasectomy operation. There has been an amazing response. Thousands of men have been queuing for it all around here. I'm not so sure about it. I sometimes go and talk to them about why they've come. This boy told me he was 27 and was married with three children and a fourth on the way. He says he wants the operation for the sake of the family, not for the money. Personally, I think this new vasectomy campaign is the wrong approach to family planning. Well, sometimes I even go and pull young boys out from the queue and persuade them this is not the right way to go about things. In fact, when I talked to that boy, Sunil Herat, later, he admitted he was only 23. Did he have any children? No. Was he married? No. He's got bad eye trouble and may never be able to marry or get a job. He needed the money. You could say it all helps to keep the birth rate down, but I don't agree. I think the slow way is better. The important thing is the changeover from just accepting what life brings to the feeling you can change your life. That only comes when you get some confidence in the future.
It's slow work. Family by family, village by village. But this slow way is certainly working in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's experience shows that while contraceptives are essential for family planning, so are education and health care, economic security, and at least some degree of emancipation for women. These changes have begun to happen in Sri Lanka. It's still a poor country, but the majority of its people have shared in the benefits of development, and the result is one of the lowest child death rates in Asia. All of these changes are reflected in falling birth rates and the 1981 census showed that annual population growth was only 1.7%, well below the developing world's average. Every region of the world, except Africa, is now reporting some slowdown of population growth. But absolute numbers of people are, of course, still going up. In India, for example, population grew by a million a month throughout the year. And the UN Fund for Population Activities is now predicting that population growth will finally come to an end in just over a hundred years from now, with two and a half times the present number of people on the planet. Can the world cope with such an increase in the density of human population? In 1981, another 80 million people have been added. By the end of the century, another 1,500 million. Whether the Earth can sustain such an increase is a question not only of how many people there are, but also of how much each of them consumes. The 16 million babies born into the northern industrialised world in 1981 will consume four times as much of the Earth's resources as the 109 million babies born into the countries of the South. This double pressure on resources from both increasing affluence and increasing numbers is first and foremost a pressure on food. So the nourishment of the human family is the next basic concern, the next chapter in the story. And we heard plenty about food in 1981. Per le famiglie che mangiano la pasta. Per tuo marito ci vuole la migliore, ci vuole vittoria. Facile da preparare, piena di carne, di sugo. E come l'ha fatta sua mamma. E a buono. Straight Schweppes. Ice, lemon, nothing but the crisp, sparkling subtlety of Schweppes tonic. Prices jump sharply in brisk trading on the Chicago Grain Exchange on news that the Soviet Union is in the market for 10 million tons of American wheat. Now that President Reagan has lifted the U.S. grain embargo, the Russians are trying to buy their way out of the crisis caused by three years of disastrous harvests. It's good news for American farmers who've been suffering from lower wheat prices, the result of bumper harvests and last year's unsold surplus. Choose the best bread, the lightest bread as part of your diet plan, and you can eat and still stay slim. If you're a real today girl, you haven't always got time to count calories. But now, you can eat the way you want, and still look the way you like. Den Flüchtlingen in Somalia und im Norden von Uganda verschlimmert sich. Von Seiten der Lebensmittel- und Landwirtschaftsorganisation der Vereinten Nationen, FAO, hieß es heute, die Nahrungsmittelhilfslieferungen in die bedürftigen Länder Afrikas müssten dringend beschleunigt werden, um die ärmsten Engpässe abzubauen. Nach Angaben der FAO hat sich das Flüchtlingsproblem verschärft. Aufgrund der schlechten Ernteaussichten in mehreren Ländern des südlichen und östlichen Afrika sei eine Verbesserung der Situation kaum zu erwarten. 26. But has he heard the latest? Buster, come on, here's your dinner. If the dog in your life knows what's good for him, he'll come running for new dog burgers. Dog burgers are the new all beef dog food you love to give him. They're in packs of 10 at leading stores now. Behind the contradictory images of food in 1981 is a simple question. How much food was grown and who ate it? In 1981, 1,400 million tons of grain were produced. One quarter of the world consumed half of it. The total harvest for the year was enough to feed one and a half times the present population of the world. So why did some members of the human family have too much food for their health and others too little? One reason is that the rich can buy up the harvests and grain moves according to economic demand, not human need. 
hunger only touched those who were too poor in money or in land. For it is the pattern of land ownership that underlies the story of nutrition. Large estates, subsistence smallholdings, commercial plantations, family farms, landless households. The surface of the earth has been divided into titles of ownership. And the question of hunger is a question of whose land grows what crops for whose benefit. Honduras, one of the most fertile countries of Central America. It was the original Banana Republic and it still provides top quality fruit for the Western world. It's also a country where half the children are growing up with malnutrition. Here in the village of La Colorada, 22 Campesino families live on a steep valley side, land which no one else wants. Two heads of maize is what Elena Vasquez could get today. Sometimes there are beans as well as maize, hardly ever meat. So the children are usually hungry and frequently ill. Most of them will probably survive their childhood, but they are growing up listless and dulled. It's not the skeletal malnutrition of famine, it's the slower malnutrition which stunts the mental and physical growth of a fifth of the world's children. The families who live on the hill at La Colorada are poor because their land is poor. The men are up every dawn clearing the steep valley sides and trying to make it grow something. But this season, once again, it's proved a losing battle. Santos Hernandez is one of those who has spent 1981 working these inhospitable slopes. Sí, eh, el año pasado, por estos tiempos, nosotros pues la tierra pues no nos produció nada porque la tierra. Well, the land has produced nothing again. You can see how poor the soil is. It does not produce anything. What maize we have got is so poor that now we cannot even have enough to feed our children. That is why we are facing such a, a desperate situation. We see our children undernourished for for want of a glass of milk. Sometimes we've no rice or beans, and there's never money to buy meat. But then you see over there, where the good land is, you see? And all that land there is owned by big American fruit companies and the rich landowners, who are supported by the government and the military. Over there, they've got uh, cattle, fruit trees, they can feed their children and send them to university every day. We work in here and we look over that land over there. We could be working on that land. Over there, that part is owned by Donna Elsa, but her cattle only use it for a few weeks in the year. I cannot tell you what we feel like, you know, when we look across at that land. It's, you feel like a cat, you know? You show him a piece of meat, but he cannot get it. Well, Don Elsa, she sells the bullocks to the Alus meat packing plant in the town. I used to work there when I was 17. It produces very good beef. As a father, you know, it makes me feel so sad because the children sometimes say to me, Papa, there is some meat, buy some meat. And it breaks my heart, you know, because I do not have enough money to, to buy even a pound of meat. Because all the meat is packed and frozen, and then it's all export abroad.
Well, everything is in a pretty bad way. This child, his body is full of uh, parasites. He's wasting away. Because children, it's like plants. They need nourishment to grow. But here, we can't even get milk. And the, the, the children here go to school at the age of five and don't learn anything because they can't cope with learning. Elena says, um, I feel like crying because I cannot see any way out. I'm worried about the children and about my mother. There are days when we eat beans, there are days when we eat nothing at all. Jose here, he nearly died of measles. Now he has got diarrhea and he doesn't even want to eat anymore. There's no one to help him. He's on his own, really. What can I do? I think, yes, I think we are pretty typical here. Because everywhere I've been in Honduras, I see the same thing. There are thousands and thousands of families in this position. And there could be plenty of land for everyone to grow maize and rice. But now, even these things have to be imported into Honduras. And you understand, we are too poor to, to buy more than just a little. In Honduras, there are two big fruit companies, United Brands and Standard Fruits. Now, between them, they own almost half a million acres, but they also control what is grown elsewhere. And they know there is no profit in maize and rice, so they grow bananas on Honduran soil and send all that fruit and profits out of this country. Why have these people got more right to Honduran land than we have? We are the ones who work this land. We are, we are the ones who are suffering. So you, you see, we are now faced with a decision whether we should invade that land, or I should say recover that land. It's lying idle, and we could use it for food. That's supposed to be the point of the agrarian reform law. We don't want confrontations with the authorities. They have all the power. The other campesinos, you know, who have tried to recover land, have been wounded by the military. Yeah, some of them have been killed. We don't want that. Uh, but when you are hungry, you think of these things. Well, we, all of us, we have a meeting to decide whether to risk trying to recover some of the land in the valley. Well, most, most of the people say it was the only way to make agrarian reform work the way it's meant to work, reallocating land that is not uh, fully used. And we talk about the risks and what could happen to us. The group leader's recommendation was that we enter the field tomorrow morning before first light, whatever the consequences. It was agreed unanimously. Tomorrow at four o'clock. Well, I suppose this is illegal, but in this struggle, all the peasants took this decision because we feel the government is also behaving illegally. They are not implementing the land reform. The land should be for the peasants who work it.
but they don't hand it over because they are selling it to landowners who have got the money to buy it. <laughs> I'm not afraid. I feel happy because everybody is optimistic. We feel a bit like uh, Christopher Columbus discovering the land which is ours. If we went on to that land in fear, then it would be better not to go to We don't ask for great riches. Nor do we cry for the sake of crying. What we claim is what is ours, the land that we can work. We knew there would be a reaction and it came very soon. At about six o'clock in the morning, the first of the owner's men came to see what we were doing. We tried to explain to him why we had taken over the land. But of course, all he did was right away to report back to Dona Elsa who lives in Progreso. In fact, the mayor is one of the few politicians who really understands our cause. Let me tell you, as mayor of Progreso, I believe in the recovery of lands like this because our people are poor. They spend their time just living from one day to the next. It goes back to feudalism, when all the best lands in Honduras were taken by foreign companies and private landowners. That was a transgression against the community. But now the peasants are reclaiming these lands, and rightly so, in order to work on them themselves. Like the landowner in this case, there are many around Progreso who have great expanses of land. Laws should not be made to favor the rich. They ought to favor the poor who want to work. Land invasions can work, and on a significant scale. All the land in this valley was taken over by a Campesina cooperative in 1965. One of the men was killed in the struggle that followed, and many more were jailed. But today the Campesinos legally own the land and have made themselves self-sufficient in food as well as producing bananas. The result is that they now keep the rewards of their own efforts. In 
In the middle of this year, there was a wave of land invasions like the one at La Colorada. Many met with violent resistance at the hands of the landowners, the government, the police and the military. At La Colorada, on day three of the occupation, the campesinos were forced to abandon the land they had cleared for planting food. Eh, con relación a la recuperación del terreno, eh, nosotros eh, decidimos retirarnos de... Well, we've had to leave the land we were occupying. We were given an ultimatum by the representatives of the Agrarian Institute. Either we leave voluntarily or they send in the police. And if we leave voluntarily, they look into our case for land. And we know what's happened elsewhere. The police have been carrying out surprise attacks on peasants and treating them like, like animals. And many peasants have been killed. So what could we do? But hunger is something that will not wait. If our problems cannot be solved by legal means, then we'll have to invade this land again. In 1981, 80% of the farmland in the poor world was controlled by 3% of the people. In 1981, 36 of the poorest and hungriest countries of the world exported food. <laughs> 